Good evening. We had a quorum. We'll call the planning board meeting to order. And first up for general information is, I believe, Jamie Callahan. Uh, good evening, uh, board members. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> Can't see you, but we can hear you. Okay. So I'm, I'm doing this for my cell phone. I couldn't be in my office. Okay. So I am uh, applying appealing to the planning board to uh, install one set of sign letters reading Alta Beauty uh, on the storefront. And we submitted a sign application for that. And I believe it follows the criteria for Hadley. Didn't you uh, didn't you join our a meeting a couple of weeks ago, or a few, or maybe last month to talk about this? Uh, no, this wasn't me regarding this this location. It might have been another meeting for uh, the Nissan dealership. Oh, okay. Okay, I had uh, received an email with that sign and I had forwarded it around to everybody. Right. I don't know if, uh, I also have it up on my screen. So let me see if I can do a screen share. And. When did you send that around Bill? Uh, last week. Yeah. Okay, I guess. I was successful getting it up, so. Uh, You're moving into the old Pier 1 location, sir? Uh, yes, that is correct. So the first issue here is, is this going to be an illuminated sign or is it going to be halo lit? Uh, no, they are uh, specifying, we are not building the sign, uh, somebody else is, but they're specifying um, internal illumination, which will be with LED. Okay. So it'll be similar to what has, uh, Whole Foods has uh, family footwear or famous footwear uh, Walmart. So it'll be the same type of construction as their signs. Was the Pier 1 sign internally illuminated? I don't remember. Yes, it, yes it was. Those were individual letters with LED lighting. So this is a grandfathered non-compliant? Yes. And does uh, what's the uh, what's the square footage of this? So the overall size of the uh, Alta Beauty, if you draw a box around the uh, entire sign, is seven foot two inches, or eighty six inches, by seventeen feet ten inches. That would seem to exceed our, uh, mm. is that anything like what was there? Uh, I don't recall, uh, Pier 1 was all on one, Pier 1 was on one level, I think, or one, one line. And I think they were there for how many years, 20 some years? So I don't know if the code has changed since then or not. You're talking about 121 square feet of sign. Well, there's a lot of negative space in the sign. 
uh, if you look at the design, the uh, the swoosh uh, that wraps around Alta takes up quite a bit of square footage. If you're going to draw a box around the whole thing, that that is how we draw, define it in the bylaw. Okay. All right. So, I mean, if you were to box out each segment of it, it would be much less than that. I'm not sure what it would be, but. Um, It'll be substantially less than that. No, the bylaw read that you draw a geometric shape around the sign itself. And if you have a lot of dead space in there, it still counts. So you basically got to cut it in half. Do you know how big the, the, the Pier 1 sign was? Uh, you know, I don't. I, I really don't. I'm, I'm going to guess that it was like two or three foot letters, maybe 24 inch. So at the time they went in, they probably had the right to put up a 64 square foot sign. We've since cut that back for multi-tenant buildings, but... <clears throat> They were probably at 64, so you got to cut this in half. Really? Okay. So we have to downsize it by at least 50%. Well, unless you can tell us, unless you can show us that well, how big Pier 1 was, Pier 1's your grandfathering. Okay. And even, that, even that's a little, that's generous, I think, because the, the fact is that sign was removed. Right. Okay. So, uh, if they were to remove the swoosh from the logo, I think that would probably comply. If we were to get, if we were to get it to... Can't read my print. I don't think so. No. It probably that would probably bring it down. I'm just eyeballing maybe 30 percent. You got to get down 50 percent. You got to get down a little more than 50 percent. Okay. What What's our max square footage with a box around it? 64. I believe it's 64 square feet. We've, we've been allowing 64 square feet on the malls. Okay. And you need to, you still need to box in the whole entire sign element. You can't individually box in all the letters. Correct. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, okay. And so if that's the board's decision, I will have to go back to them. Uh, uh, how about this blade sign that you're looking at right now? Is that, uh, is that in compliance? It's not eliminated. It's, um, is that kind of against the square footage? We do make an exception for directional signs. So we'd probably, how, how big is the blade sign? Three by. So the oval, the oval is three. Uh, 37 inches by one foot seven, no, one foot, one foot three, so 13 inches. Uh, sorry, 12, 13, 15 inches. And they'll just be the 37 one. by 15. Yeah, I, I would think that one's okay. We'll call that a directional sign. Okay. Okay. That's the one you just have the one and it's perpendicular to the building. So it will not be, it's end on to the road. So shouldn't be an issue. Okay. All right, so I need to go back to my customer and decrease it down to 64 square feet uh, with a box around it. <coughs> Yeah, or whatever, uh, whatever you, if you could demonstrate that Pier 1 was larger and the landlord may have 
some information on that. Um, yeah, Bill, I just emailed you a picture of the old Pier One at uh, Mountain Farms, but okay. that doesn't ha that doesn't have scale on it, but it's big. So he'll 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 need to document that. Okay, and I, am I effectively sharing that now or not? That's up to you. Well, no, I'm trying to. I don't know if anyone else can see it. I I have it up, but I don't know if it's being shared. No, I'm, no I'm we're just seeing the Ultra Beauty sign. Okay. Ultra. You still see Ultra. Okay. So, all right. Let me see. Okay. I'm on my laptop and it not uh, not working for me the way I'd like to. So, uh, actually, let me see if I can do a new share. Bring his pause. Bring your yeah, yeah. I think you have to stop sharing and then go. You know. I can do something called a new share, but I'm not sure that uh oh here we go there we go there it is pretty big isn't it yeah yeah we, we can't tell how big that was yeah you you'd have to go out there and measure the storefront and well, th get that, a... that, that that's the job for the tenant to do for the yeah owner. oh absolutely the landlord and the tenant can work that out. Okay. So uh, when's the next meeting where we can uh, re reapply? January 5th. Uh, January 5th, yeah. January 5th. The planning board meets. We meet the first and third Tuesday of every month. Okay. So... I will let my customer know that uh, this is oversized and we need to come back with a much smaller sign package. Um, I hope it doesn't affect the uh, uh, tenant's decision, but we'll hopefully, uh, hopefully they're okay with that. Uh, they're going to look at all the other tenants and say, how come we are, how come we're, we have to be so much smaller when they could, they, all the other could, tenants have large signs. They could be as large as Pier 1. But you have to demonstrate, okay. you have to let us, you have to demonstrate how big Pier 1 was. All right, so if, if Pier 1 was larger than what we're proposing, if you can we're okay, we can match great. the same square footage. Right. Okay. Okay, I will get back to them, and we'll probably see you on January fifth. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you, board members. All right. Take care. Enjoy the holidays. So, oh, I got Joseph yeah. Grandick here, Mister Boysbert. You there, Joe? You're on mute. Yep. Can you hear me now? We can hear you. All right, I'm going to try to get it all figured out. There I am. We are. Okay. You're up. Okay, so um, I had talked to Tom, Tommy Quinlan, who advised me to check with you guys. Um, Shelly and I at the Sugar Shack are looking to add an additional outdoor freezer, um, mostly for our frozen um, grass-fed beef that we're you know processing and the sales of that stuff. Um, it's going to go directly behind the existing sugar shack right next to two other freezers that are there with a roof system over it. Um, this box here would not have a structure over it because it's a state-of-the-art fiberglass, very efficient freezer box. It's approximately eight feet wide, eight feet tall, and 24 feet long um, that comes all built plug and play set on a concrete slab. Um, the only way it's visible from the road is if you physically stop on Stockwell Road um, and look behind there and try to find it. Um, so I'm asking you for your permission. Tommy Quinlan brought it up only because 
I guess, some problems in the past of things that look like Connex boxes, you know, dropped at businesses that, um, you know, were not acceptable. So that's the only reason I'm, you know, here talking to you folks tonight. You you grow the cap, the beef? The beef is all grown right across from your house, yes. That's what I thought. So isn't yes. it agriculturally exempt? Well, it's exempt to a point. Is this part of the sugar shack or part of the uh, the uh, market, if you would, Joe? Well, it's going to be used in the market, you know what I mean? But it's, you know, we're all, you know, it's all one right there, Jim. So I'm not quite sure how to answer that. Our, our freezer and cooler for the market is the existing boxes behind the original sugar shack. Okay. Let, let me rephrase that question. Is this used for agri um, the agricultural exemption part of the store? Well, it is because it's our beef that we're raising on Mount Warner Road, okay. um, processing and bringing the frozen beef back to put in the cooler. So, yes, in okay. the freezer. Okay. So it's not subject. To, I just want to make. So I want to separate what could or could not be applicable to site plan approval and the twenty five hundred square feet of the market. So this is part of the agricultural exemption part of your market. That is one hundred percent correct, Jim. Yes, okay, that's fine. Um, as far as, um, I mean, it's not a. How do I say this? It's not a. It's not a storage trailer. Not at all. No. No. It's eight foot wide. It's just shy of eight eight foot wide, shy of eight foot, yes. It doesn't contribute to parking requirements because it's not part of the business floor area. Correct. So um, uh, I'll, can we make a motion to waive site plan review because it's subject to the agricultural exemption? I'm, it's exactly. I'm not, I don't think we I'm even not quite sure what we're waving. We got to make sure we got to make make sure the motions for what we're waving. Okay. I, uh, okay. Um, what are we waving on this bill? That it's not really. It's, if it's already it's already exempt from site plan approval because it's agricultural, right? And it's not a storage trailer. So I think we're just looking for a determination. I don't even know if we have to make a vote so much as just to agree that it is agriculturally exempt and can proceed without further ado. Okay. Sounds good. So we don't need a vote? Or do we? Maybe just to cover ourselves. Okay. Make, re remake your motion, Mike, please. Make a, mo make a vote that determine the determination has been made that this is not subject to site plan review because it is agriculturally exempt. And it's not a storage trailer. It is not a storage trailer. Okay, good. We have a second? I would second that. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Four zero with one absent right now. Joe hasn't been able to get on yet. Although his sign, look, his name is there. He's there. He's, can you hear us, yeah. Zeke? Can you hear Joe? You're not on. Lights yet. are on, but nobody's home. Okay. Well, anyways, you're all set, Joe. All right. <laughs> anyway. Thank you all. If I don't see you, um, all you have a nice holiday. Yeah, you, you same too. to you. Take care. Stay safe. Um. Uh, looks Lisa like Sanderson. I see your name there. You have a question, Lisa? Lisa, did you guys have a sign-up? You're on mute. Well, hi there. Hi there. Go. Go ahead. I was just here to hear what's going on with the Route Nine, um, the land taking. Okay. That'll be coming up shortly. Who is Hadley's iPad for? Uh, DPW Chris Okafo. Oh, okay. You have Hi, some, Chris. Thank you. You have a question for something, or are you just here to visit? I'm here to visit and to hear the MS4 discussions. Okay. So, Chris, the uh, MS4 is on the um, 
is on there as a placeholder. I don't think we're actually going to be getting to discussing the MS4 regulations tonight. Uh, thank you very much for your heads up. I appreciate that. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Bill, did we have a sign-up sheet other than uh, Jamie and Joe? Uh, and Lisa. Uh, no, that's it. That's okay. It. Everyone else is... Uh, yeah, everyone else is in the business. No civilians. <laughs> or or audience. Yeah. Mr. Comia. Mr. Comia. Hi, board. Good evening. Good evening to you all. Let me tell you, this has been a challenge trying to decipher a lot of this stuff. Um, and um, I know I sent the board at least the resources this afternoon. Um, and so that, th that's kind of what the, because no other community and this has been sprung up as this very important thing that communities that have this floodplain overlay have to complete by the time maps are approved, um, which I mentioned at the last meeting that um, in my discussion with the floodplain manager, the maps for um, the communities along the Connecticut River weren't gonna be completed until 2022, early 2022. So presumably um, that is when the bylaws to address those new maps um, should be completed. But um, so I did some initial work and I apologize um, for not sending that as I was working up until it was my turn. Um, but, oh, Bill, can I share screen? Sure. Let me enable that. All set. Okay. So the biggest thing here is that um, you have in section 13, the bylaw that currently exists in your zoning um, that addresses the map from 1978 and the panels from the, the map that's addressed within the, the bylaw. There are some new session, sections um, that are required to be included in a um, zoning bylaw amendment or ordinance amendment. Um, and those are the ones that are in yellow. So the next version of this, um, this, is, this was to organize my thoughts and see where within your bylaw you address the items that are required in the model. Um, so, you know, you, you, like any other bylaw that the town has passed, you have your purpose. Um, you talk about the maps which set up the, the, um, the uh, applicability of the bylaw to the maps, um, what's covered in the maps, um, as well as understanding that there are some requirements for subdivision proposals, um, base flood elevation for those proposals, um, floodway encroachment, which is you know, located in here, as well as ways to notify the uh, National Flood Insurance Program with regards to any water course alteration or relocations in riverine areas or um, your flood zones and your drainage requirements. And, and you'll see within the bylaw where those items are listed. There are some additional items that you have in there too. Um, I don't think it's a, a detriment to have them um, because it, it's always good to have some additional context for the bylaw. Um, so I'm, I mean, I'm just going over my approach as far as the way that I think the next iteration will actually be some amendments. Um, and the amendments, I think, will look typically like a bylaw would, um, and that's listed here. Um, purpose, general, district delineation, administration, provisions for flood ha hazard reduction, and those are your standards and the notification requirements that the state is um, requiring be part of the bylaw amendments. Um, use regulations 
and and within that floodways um, and then severability um, and then another point. And you'll see that within the, um, the materials that I, I shared with you and the links that I shared with you. It's a lot of dense um, information in regards to flood zones and whatnot. Um, the approach has been to just ensure that the language that is shared in the model exists in your bylaw. And so obviously there are gonna be some amendments that are gonna be required um, to, to um, discuss. I think one of the big things, and I know this has been brought up, is your approach to development or special permit granting of what you call mobile residential units in the floodway. Um, it's not typical that that happens, but I think there might have been some sort of impetus for that, um, that the town may have back when explored that and, and allowed it. Um, and I know that you may be having some challenges with, with that now. Um, so I don't know if there's any context that you can provide that um, may be helpful in either amending the section, which doesn't necessarily say that you can't have that, but um, you know, if, if there is an approach or an idea that the, the community doesn't want that type of development, then that should be brought forth. Okay, Ken, I, I guess I have as much background as anyone. And I wrote a lot of that section. Okay. The, um, about the mobile residential units. Uh -huh. The impetus was it was happening. And our bylaw, as you know, is written in a sort of the, the, in the negative exclusive that anything not allowed is prohibited. Right. Uh, but people were down there uh, with setting up campsites, bringing a trailer in for the summer. Um, and the idea at the time was, um, you know, these are our constituents by and large, uh, uh, was to legitimize it and create a system to make sure that people were um, in general compliance. And I know the building inspector at the time, Tim Nyhart, was going through the regulations with us and trying to find ways to make it legitimate for people to be down there on their spending part of their summer on their land. Mm -hmm. um, over time, it has become, it, it, it was never tended very well. And like anything that isn't uh, pruned, it grows out of uh, control. So um, the building inspector as zoning enforcement officer uh, never made it a priority to get people in front of the ZBA to get their permits. And so if someone would see, someone may, might get a permit, their neighbor would see that there was a trailer now and the neighbor would pull their trailer in, and but not get a permit for it. Um, then uh, there is some more pressure because uh, neither Northampton nor Hatfield, as I understand it, allow such uses in the floodplain or the floodway. Um, and I don't know, South Hadley's kind of a rocky coastline in there for a lot of it, so I don't think it's been a big issue there either. Uh, so we're getting a lot of pressure now from uh, people who are intentionally purchasing Hadley riverfront property for the purpose of setting up a camp here, um, whether they're from Agawam or Chicopee or Northampton or Hatfield for that matter. And um, it, it's, it's just sort of gotten out of control, which is why we're, there's a parallel process going on to uh, recognizing that this is critical to our participation in the flood insurance program uh, make sure that uh, we get a better handle on what is and isn't being allowed along the river. And we're probably going to 
going to have to exclude people from camping in the uh, uh, in the flood way, but perhaps allowing them to use flood plain property. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's where we started. That's where how we ended up where we are. Yeah, and flood plain, um, because your definition, and this is obviously a planner's um, um, perception of the of the situation um, is that you've identified your mobile residential unit as what FEMA has identified as their recreational vehicle, um, which is it, its its implication is that it's temporary and can be moved, um, assuming that there's some sort of flood event um, that is going to happen. Um, and I think that for the purposes of this, knowing that, you know, you, the, the town is, is caught in this position um, of knowing that that type of development is in the floodway when it's not necessarily, um, wouldn't typically be found there. And then now having to address the fact that there are, um, you know, that, that there is a market in Hadley for, you know, this type of usage, um, you know, it comes, it comes as a town policy. And I, you know, obviously there is uh, the ability to have those types of, of um, uses in town, but, you know, should this amendment um, basically eliminate that, use within the floodway um that's going to be a big policy question um i don't know that's kind of the the biggest other than just um refining the bylaw which you know there, a lot of the things are new and um there are just some language things that needed to be added like um the designation of the community floodplain administrator which I think is established as the building inspector. And, um, you know, there's, there needs to be in this bylaw a variance uh, to building code floodplain standards, which is not in here. That needs to be um, listed on here. Um, but the, the, the big amendment is going to be how to address mobile residential units in the floodway. Um, if because the model does allow it, as you'll see number 18 on this um, on the screen there's a section which has similar language um, that all recreational vehicles to be placed on a site must be elevated and anchored in accordance with the zones regulations for foundation and elevation requirements to be on a site for less than 180 consecutive days or be fully licensed and highway ready. Um, so that is the definition that those types of vehicles presumably would need to somehow fit within um, the flood plain, um, within any of those flood zones um, to be able to be, to live there basically, or to um, site themselves there. Um, but yeah, I, Again, you know, this was the initial stab based on looking at the materials that were provided in the state model. Um, I do have some outstanding questions that haven't been answered by them that I'm still working on. Um, but I think that the um, process of which to amend these are probably gonna be simple. The big question is gonna be how to address the development in the floodway. Um, there are going to be some definitions changes, and I think that it might be beneficial because I think that the warrant item that was supposed to be in this previous town meeting hasn't yet been acted upon. Is that correct for definitions? Correct. Okay. Um, so I don't know if it's worthwhile to address them in that section. Um, 
but um, that's kind of the initial stab at this particular process. Um, what I learned too, which is interesting because I wasn't under the assumption that this was typical, was that the floodplain management approval is the last approval that has to be signed off um, in town. So presumably the building permit, and I don't know how, how it is in Hadley. I know in, in communities that I work in, there's this checklist that the building department, when they go down the list, they, they will say, does this get zoning clearance? Does this get conservation commission approval? Um, floodplain is the last thing. And if the uh, building inspector acts on that, then that makes it easy, but um, it should be the last thing that's approved um, for a project. Um, but yeah, that's kind of my initial observation of your bylaw and the, the ease at which for the most part, it's going to be um, simple to just kind of organize this in a way that follows a typical best practice form, which I've proposed below in this section, um, and just do some maneuvering of, of the, the various sections into that. So the um, building, building inspector, I'm getting a little reverberation there. Um, the building inspector is working on um, setting up a working group that will have representatives from building, planning, conservation, That's great. Uh, emergency services, to try to um, talk through some of the policy issues that may, that may come up. Is this specific to the floodplain work? It is. It is. It's it's part of uh, Tom Quinlan's effort as zoning enforcement officer <clears throat> to get on top of the question, uh, top of the issue of what is the structure? Because uh, among other things, emergency management is asking. You know, we don't know who's there. We don't know who to talk to if we get a warning of an imminent danger. Um, and um, they're, they're really concerned about it. Mm -hmm. um, now, as you're going through the bylaw, you may also see some other references. Hadley has its own um, flood zones, which are not exactly the same as the FEMA flood zones. That was uh, a relic of a much earlier effort to address this. I, and I think if Joe is here, he can speak to that. But it uh, was even, can you hear me, Bill? Yes, we can. Uh, that was even before my time. And it's, it's designated, certainly on our map, the Hadley floodplain versus the federal floodplain. So, uh, but it, kind of it was a relic from the past that was before uh, the the entire planning board was from Hadley and they didn't even recognize the fact that the river flooded in North Hadley as well that was kind of the joke back then but uh, there are two designated things and you are right Bill and this may be a good time to consider uh, deleting that section if it's no longer necessary. Although what we do, um, what we've done is flat out prohibit new residential construction in the Hadley flood zone. Is that the same as the, I'm looking at your bylaw at the moment, um, aquifer protection? No. 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 Um, if you look at, uh, do you have a copy of our zoning map? Well, you probably do somewhere because you, PVPC created it. Yeah. But it has a bunch of uh, like five or six inset maps along the side. And one of them is the Hadley floodplain. Okay. I can send to you a copy if you don't have one. Oh, I see. Is the Hadley floodplain addressed within the bylaw? Yes. <clears throat> yeah, there's a separate section on Hadley floodplain. Hmm. We were going, we, a few years ago, this, uh, can we try, we were thinking of con uh, consolidating 
the Hadley floodplain and the federal floodplain. Yep. But they are noticeably different with noticeably different regulations. And it was going to be a nightmare to try to consolidate. So we just left them alone. Okay. And now maybe it's time to do something with those um, because of all this new stuff coming up with MS and the floodplain, et cetera. Um, so we'll have to look at that. Just a quick question. What is, you got fed, floodplain management approval is last. That right was now. what, that was what I'm, when I was talking about, um, and this is what I learned from one person. I don't know if it's the end all be all because everyone has some sort of different addressing on this. And I, I feel like when you go through approvals or when the building permit is ready to basically approve, you know, the construction, um, my understanding is that the floodplain management approval is after that. So ensuring that the construction documents um, and all of the documents required for certifying your base flood elevation um, and um, ensuring that within the site plan, you know, that, it's in, that it is in conformance with um, your floodplain regulations that um, that is when approval of the whole, you know, of the building or the structure um, is, is to occur. They will uh, actually get a building permit before floodplain management approval? That is my understanding that ludicrous. if if there is a community that has and it's it's probably easier if the building inspector serves as the floodplain manager right but in in any other instance where that's not the case um that does pose a lot of like it's like that's really weird especially with permitting expediency and ensuring that you want mm -hmm. permits to get approved and and you know um <laughs> But that was my understanding, um, based on a conversation yeah. that I had with yeah, regards yeah. to that permitting, it, because there are specific documents that need to be attached to that building permit. Um, and I don't know um, currently what, what's happening in Hadley or any of the other communities with regards to development in the floodplain, um, which is usually residential development, I would say. Um, I would agree that does seem counterintuitive because you you would want to, uh, as a, a designer's client, you would want to address the big questions first and not get that far invested in a, in a design or a project or whatever before you find out, oh, you know, you can't meet the floodplain, you know. Yeah, and I, I feel like it, I don't think in practice it works that way. It's it suggests that that is the final all end all approval, um, especially if your development in a floodplain. Um, however, you know I think it's to identify the processes by which the National Flood Insurance Program and the and the FEMA people that come and make these community visits to ensure that the town is compliant with the bylaws um in in the process and if they are you know driving by and they see these um they they see um activities that are happening in questionable areas let's say um they can ding the community for not being compliant with those standards um i haven't really seen that um i don't really work in 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 well, before we get to that one, we'll have to double verify that that is the case because there's something, so, something doesn't quite seem a, a, appropriate with that sentence. Um, let me see what that, that's number 10. So, um, yeah, if 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 you look at the guide that um, I shared this afternoon, there is this. Um, there's some good description of, of of what it's trying to communicate. Maybe I didn't capture it correctly. Um, I 
Yeah, it's on. It's on page twenty of this um, PDF that I sent earlier. But let me see if I can pull that up. That probably would be easier. Um, I'll do that. Yeah, I'm on my iPad, and that's on my Mac at my other property. Um, do you see this? Yes. So this is what I was. This was the section that I was referring to, with regards to that and approval. Um, So it's this floodplain development review form. Um, I don't know the process by which your building inspector approves, um, you know, development in the floodplain, but um, presumably that any sort of situation where there might be a question about development in the floodplain would have already been handled um, by him. Um, Yeah, you would you would think that you would want that to be a checkbox on your building permit application. You know, have you met you know floodplain management requirements? Well, I would, yeah. you know, I I could see a you know someone getting a building permit and then finding out that they can't meet that and doing everybody because they paid for a permit and then couldn't build. So that was what I was referring to with regards to that. Um, again, I think it's in process. It's in, um, in how the building department handles approval of development in that and ensures that it has the documentation that it needs. Um, because, you know, as, as you look at the next section, assure that all necessary permits are obtained if, you know, if you have a um, site plan or any land use um, approval granting authorities um, like uh, planning board or conservation commission or ZBA, um, that those permits are all handled prior to dealing with um, floodplain. In, in, Bill, isn't Hadley, isn't the Conservation Commission the floodplain review authority in a way? They have been. They yeah, have. that's a good point, Jim. That You're right, they have been. And the determination ultimately comes down to a, uh, if you go for a mortgage, the bank has a, uh, a catch-all company in Houston, Texas, that verifies if it is in the floodplain or isn't in the floodplain. It really, I don't think, determined or it is determined by the local people. Yeah. The, the one question I have about the, the, in this case, would be the Hadley Conservation Commission being the final review of the way it's written. Then they're going to be responsible to make sure that. The, the applicant has gotten as a, a Z zoning variance required site plan approval and building permits. That's way beyond their capabilities normally. Well, I don't think that, are you suggesting that Conservation Commission be the final approval? I, I, I think the the floodplain administrator is supposed to be that person to ensure that approvals happens. have happened, but he or she would be the sign off um, to ensure that it's compliant with floodplain regulations. Yeah. So, so that, is no, that task has normally been by the Conservation Commission for the floodplain. Um, I was think that to establish the boundary or was that to sign off on insurance that it was compliant with the floodplain regulations. Some of both. And I think it then went, goes on to the building inspector because <clears throat> whatever they propose for flood proofing has to meet building code. Right. I, I think ultimately it's the building inspector who is going to 
be everything comes back to him uh, because these should be pre pre prerequisites to issuance of a building permit. They should be prerequisites to ap ap application for a building permit, probably. And normally that would be the case, um, you know, as as the planning board of the ZBA or Conservation Commission provide their approvals, the building inspector will ensure that they got those approvals accordingly. And if there's any special conditions attached to that, would ensure that that was the case when it was being developed or after the fact. Um, I think this bylaw, there is a requirement to establish the community floodplain administrator. Um, and that needs to be stated within the bylaw. So that will be part of this amendment. Um, and I think presumably it's going to be the building inspector. Um, and it sounds as if that department is familiar with, you know, what, what expectations there are with development in the floodplain and what regulations. Um, and, and, we're, and we're probably making more out of this right now than we need to. We could probably fine tune that and address these concerns when the time comes up by making the building inspector the official floodplain approver, but the conditions, that, et cetera, still will belong with the Conservation Commission like it has been going on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I mean, other than that, um, you know, the next, the next stab at this will be to put the bylaw in, in a typical fashion, um, here, and then maybe it's worthwhile to keep the language that you have for, um, requiring a special permit within the floodway for, recreational vehicles um, and then deciding you know when you have your public hearing what what happens for from that point so the the local the local floodplain is um, it appears in section 2.1 of the bylaw types okay. of districts and it's called uh, the uh, the flood overlay district, those geographical areas, which by virtue of their relationship to components of the natural hydrology have substantial importance and flood. And then the second part of that uh, section goes on to say these, these are as shown on the plane on the uh, zoning map. Okay. So, um, it, it's a, it's a relic. And I, I guess the, the thing is that the federal, as Jim was saying, the, the federal rules do not prohibit um, uh, residential development in, in the floodplain. And we, at least in the Hadley floodplain, wanted to prohibit it because, as I understand it, the fire department got tired of rowing out to uh, rescue people who were uh, who waited too long to leave. Mm -hmm. um, so that led to a prohibition of, um, but uh, yeah, this may be a time to revisit that to the extent that we can maintain a prohibition on new residential development in the floodplain if we can. I'm not sure that we can, but it's worth looking into. Yeah, um, I'll take a look and see how other communities address so if, can, if, can, yeah. uh, maybe I missed that part, but does FEMA prohibit uh, trailers, recreational vehicles in a floodway? Hadley does permit them, as Bill was saying, through the special permit category from May to October. Um, so will our special permit be able to stand or will we have to rewrite it? to say out of the floodway. It's it's one of those, 
it is silent on recreational vehicles being in the floodway. There are certain zones where they are allowed um, or, you know, it's permitted that FEMA won't have an issue with it. Um, and it aligns a lot with the, the regulations that you have placed for the special permit for mobile residential units. Um, well, that's but, what I mean, mobile residential and stuff. Right. It's, it's, there's nothing with regards to floodway. Um, that was one of my questions to the um, floodway program people um, that I haven't yet got a response to. Um, but it will be, I think, we'll get a better idea of how to approach that um, once I get that response. Mm -hmm. um, it's not typical, I don't think. It's, it's not typical that you have that type of development in a floodway or allow for the permit, you know, that type of use. And I think it's based on Bill's um, history of, of that particular, um, that, that inclusion within your bylaw, it seems that that's the case in some of the surrounding communities that have established that there is a prohibition on those types of uses within the floodway. It may seem like a technicality, but it would be critical to us to save because we could save our special permit, of course, with a little bit of tightening up so there would be some identification of where they are and who they are in case some high water comes. Yeah, I think one of the big things that the, the determination would have to be by the, um, I think it will require... It, the goal of having development in these floodplain, especially with recreation, there needs to be a documentation that it's not going to create or change the pattern of water, um, you know, with a development or with a structure. Um, and more than likely, that won't be the case with one singular mobile structure, right, that could pick up and leave during the instance of a flood. However, I think that the town has to be um, consistent with the requirements uh, that documents that. Um, you know, if there's a special permit that's required and the ZBA is that granting authority, that the ZBA should be requiring documentation and sometimes I think it could be pricey of some engineering study that that particular structure won't cause uh, you know, additional flood risk. I, I'm not sure how to really word it, but there is that documentation that needs to happen um, with that type of development, um, with any type of development in the floodplain. So I'm not sure, and it sounds as if the experience of that particular permit has been spotty um, and not enforced evenly, but, you know, should the town continue thinking of that um, or, or wanting to um, proceed with allowing that, um, then I think uh, a discussion about process and materials that would be needed to ensure that that was the case. So that if FEMA came to the town, that the town would have documentation that it was reviewed accordingly. Um, and, you know, mm -hmm. it really is to protect the town at, at the end of the day um, to ensure that the developments that, that the town are permitting, you know, won't be a cause of the, some additional flood risk. So just what do you mean additional flood risk? The, the suggestion the, is the, that the river is the river's going to flood. It's going to go where it's going to go. I mean, right. But. When you talk about structures or that that the building or structure doesn't add to the impact. Right. You can't raise the elevation to, you can't reduce the topography's ability to flood. If you, I mean, or you can't increase its, you know, you have to, you can't decrease its ability to hold water. So if you add, you know. All right. Who was the guy over on um, uh, 
over where the conservation is that built his horse track back in a flood zone. Well, that that wasn't no, that wasn't that, that wasn't was a flood a, zone. It was that, that, that was a wetlands. That's right. That's right, yeah. But yeah, you can't raise above it, and that basically kicks the can downstream to m making others downstream flood worse. That's the intent. Right. So in the context of the mobile residential units or recreational vehicles, the concern is that if we do have a flood, we start sending these torpedoes downriver aimed at the Hoyoke Dam, among other things. Yeah. Um, and, and since we don't allow new residential construction in, uh, in the floodway or the floodplain, there's not so much of the compensatory storage issue with regard to those uses it's the um it's the what if they just where what are they going to end up doing when they float down river well the river floods usually in march and april mm -hmm. and then it's over then it's over and most of these people don't bring their vehicles in until probably the end of may probably so but this whole Point. This whole thing is, I don't know why you're bring, even bringing it up. It's not going to flood then. Well, we, 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 or we're, checking off someone, we're checking off someone else's block, but that's okay. Yeah. We, we're partly there anyway. But, you know, some of what's going on down there, these people are bringing in big trailers or uh, motorhomes. Uh, one person who I believe lives in Agawam has been, it, it, you gotta love these first world problems. Um, they've been trying for a couple of years now to get the electric company to extend electric service. I think they're off of Aquavita Jeez. Road somewhere. To extend electric service to their campsite because they're tired of running their generator to power the air conditioner during the summer. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, that's absurd too. I mean, there, so there has to be a reasonable have, man type thing you have this standard that, they, that oh, it's okay fema says it's okay to have recreational vehicles more or less down there but they have to be roadworthy or they have to be tied down and now you have something a trailer a motorhome what have you that uh is connected to the grid um and, and we don't know if these are people who just drive it out every weekend, uh, drive in every weekend, or they leave it there and arrive by car. But that's going to be a hard thing to to move in a hurry. Zeke, is your former teammate on that illustrious basketball team one of the people that are violating this bylaw? <laughs> no. No? No more. The Hey, Ken, just to go back, um, I, I didn't put in my notes because I don't have access on this computer to the document. Who was the author? Who or what, author, what organization was the author of that document that you referenced with the Section 10 on, uh, you know, that was saying that the flood management sign off? Uh, was that? that is um, the... Uh, it's the floodplain manager, the state floodplain manager. So, um, oh, so that's coming from Boston. Yeah. Hmm. The biggest challenge, um, and this is something that we're talking about as a planning community, because this actually just popped up maybe yesterday in a listserv about the requirements under this model bylaw. Um, because floodplain bylaws in other parts of the Commonwealth are not, you know, they don't address certain things. And um, so there's going to be cons questions about consistency and what also is included in the bylaw. Well, it, it seems to me you've got to ha hold the landowner accountable. I mean, you can put all the rules in there you want to, but if he lets people go down there and you don't do anything, then it's unenforceable. It has to. It has to stop at the land landowner, and that's where you have to assess fines and whatever. Yeah, and enforcement has been lacking. But I don't think it's going to be our 
you know, the building inspectors or anybody else's responsibility to go down to the waterfront and say, hey, you can't have this thing there. If it's if well, somebody par parked their camp there, it has to be the responsibility of the landowner. And you start well, putting fines in place. Well, the, building inspector, working. the building inspector is the zoning enforcement officer. Yeah, he, I know. The, he's the one who can, who can levy the fines. We can't. But it has to go to the landowner. It can't go to the people that are putting their vehicles down there. Yeah, yeah and when you when you think about the fine, you know, the landlord collecting whatever he or she is collecting from the the um, those with um, trailers, is the fine even like what's this fine from you know the town um, pennies you know because it's being covered by the rent. Yeah, it has to be significant. Yeah. So the, the pattern seems to be that a, a landowner will set up a vehicle on their property by the river. Um, and the bylaw talks about one, one camper, one RV per lot, but they like to have bigger groups. So uh, well, I have two acres. Why don't you bring your RV and park it next to mine? And so some spaces down there, the landowner is one of the five people who have a trailer on the two acres. Yeah. And then they get the build the uh, fire chief nervous because they don't want they don't want to go be filling those uh, uh, twenty pound propane tanks every weekend. They want to get a uh, an eighty pound propane tank that will that will ha serve everybody's grill <laughs> and they leave that there in the uh you know between visits so now you've gotten into uh fire code areas so uh it, it's just it's grown uh it's grown a lot beyond uh <clears throat> you know your nephew's pitching a tent down where, uh, where the brook goes into the river so, so the the amount of the fine is built into the town bylaws. Yeah, because it it's it's built into the zoning. And how um, much is, do we know? How much it is? Is it what three hundred? I think that's probably typical. Yeah, it's it's so much a day. Then after so many days, it's two hundred, then three hundred. Well, th that's how you enforce it. I mean. Well, you almost don't have to change the bylaw. Just start enforcing what you got on the books. This is just like anything else. Well, you can put as many bylaws on the books as you want to, but if it's not enforced, it's meaningless. Mike, that's part of the problem. But the, the other part of the problem is most of the communities on either side of us, Hatfield, Whiteley, Sunderland, Northampton, uh, do not allow trailers or recreational vehicles parked there. So they all come to Hadley. And what was a few trailers now is in the hundreds sometimes. Well, so it's, it's if more it's one of a, per lot, a zoning it's, issue too. If it's one per lot and you got five on the lot, then he's going to get be fined uh, $1,200 a day. That'll catch somebody's attention. The only time it was taken to court, uh, I don't know if you guys remember this, but it was uh, when Mitch owned the Mitch's Marina originally, and he said he was grandfathered in for some trailers. It went to court, and I think he was given seven or nine as grandfathering, grandfathered in. But obviously, the uh, the number down there is taking some liberty to that number. If you look. Well Am I wrong to say that it doesn't matter how you redesign the bylaw? If, it's, if it's what's on the books is not enforced, and it's meaningless. We shouldn't be spending time talking about it. That, that That's true, Mike, and the enforcement is part of the problem. Enforcing yeah, the so this is, you know, either the select board should say enforce the bylaw, or we should just pass over this because we've we just been going around in circles here. Well, And, and that's what's probably going to come down to when this, this, the federal revisions come up is that the select are going to have to simply do something. And this, the controversy has not eased up over time either because this uh, special permit was a 
excellent compromise. Was it Jim or Bill that was on the subcommittee that framed that one? No, I think it was Bill. I think it was Bill, yes. It was well done, but nevertheless, when it went to the town meeting, it only passed by one vote. And it so it's probably still controversial. So I think I think part of the problem was a miscommunication. A lot of people who perhaps voted against it were voting against it because they didn't want us regulating their trailers, which I was explaining to Ken earlier, the way our bylaw is written, if it's not permitted, it is prohibited. That's correct. And I think people were voting against it because they thought we were uh, we were inhibiting what they were doing when in fact we were enabling what they were doing. Uh, yeah, there was no doubt some, mis some misinterpretation at town meeting on that. But trying to convince them otherwise was not working. Has, do you, do you know if the community has had any visits by um, people that manage the flood insurance program? I don't know. You're aware. Okay. We did have, uh, and I think several of us were there. We did have a visit from someone from whoever is in MEMA or whoever, someone from the state who is tasked with coordinating with FEMA. Okay. On flood issues. And I forget what department she was from, but. Um, we did have a, uh, a conversation with her. I think Joe was there, Jim. Oh, oh that was different. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I thought you're talking about visiting the the flood air, the the trailer issues or making noise noise of that. But we have had people come to town about uh, the system in general, the the, the overall flood program. Um. Because sometimes what happens during those visits is they're going to ask the, you know, if the town is a floodplain administrator the and review the bylaw. Um, and the reason why I asked is to see if there were any comments with regards to the bylaw, um, just to be aware of, um, or any concerns regarding the bylaw. Okay. No, no, we really haven't had it. We have not had an enforcement visit. Joe, okay. by the way, you're you are muted. I muted you when your phone rang, so you can unmute yourself. Got it. I love the power I have here. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you turn off our cameras so you don't have to see us? <laughs> uh, I don't think I can do that, but I actually, I um, someone at the last meeting. Uh, walked away from their computer and left it on. There was something in the background. So I had to <laughs> throw them out of the meeting uh, oh, no. just to, to blank them. I'm waiting for Jim's completion and unveiling of the project, T taking down the blue tarp there. Oh, that's Are you going to have a ribbon cutting? That, no, they're just a bookcase behind me. The, the tarp is up because they're cutting holes in the ceiling. Oh, so you get the drywall um, dust? Um, Putting HVAC up in the in the, in the attic, and also for the fire alarm, smoke alarms. Yeah. And so that I've got that uh, what do you call it? Uh, cellulose insulation. It's like raining dust. <laughs> so until that's completely done, which will probably be another couple of weeks, this will stay up. When it's done, you're just going to see a bookcase behind me, but just to keep the dust from getting oh. it. All right. Have we? Exhausted, Ken. I think so. So, so you know, the 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 goal is to at the next meeting, um, or even just send it um, for your review, is to put the language that's in the model accordingly where it's supposed to go, but also move what currently is your section thirteen into what I've proposed at this proposed bylaw form, which is your purpose, general district delineation, administration, um, provisions for flood hazard reduction, use regulations and severability, which are required components of the model. Um, but just placing it there. So you'll see both where I moved 
those sections and where I added sections through okay. um, the next document that you see. So the argument that Mitch's Marina had years ago that their grandfather doesn't hold any water in terms of what's going on now. Grandfathering has no consequence. Um, it's not consequential. Well, it's not so much grandfathering now as um, grandfathering is triggered when a zoning bylaw changes and a previously right. permitted use is no longer permitted. What we have now is more of an enforcement issue uh, where there, okay. are, there are a couple of um, provisions of the Zoning Act that say that if something, if, if a complaint hasn't been acted on with five, within five or six years, for instance, if I build a house too close to the uh, street, if I ignore the front yard setback, but no one calls me on it for, I think it's six years, I'll say, um, I can't be disturbed. They get after, if they notice it after five years, they can tell me to move my foundation. But if they miss it, um, the it's a statute of limitations, like, like any other. So um, there may be problems with some of these people being um, being able to say that uh, you know we're your right to enforce has has lapsed, but but there has to be there has to be an, a complaint lot by lot by lot. You can't just have a blanket. You know there are a lot of there are a lot of gray areas here, and um, yeah, not sure how we're going to deal with it quite okay. yet. But we're working on it. So we don't want a class action suit. Excuse me. We don't want a class action suit. Yeah. Um, so our next meeting is January fifth. We do have two public hearings scheduled for that, and as as of the moment, one or both of them will probably proceed. Uh, our meeting after that, January nineteenth potentially has a high profile contested public hearing. Although as of today, as of this afternoon, the Board of Health has not received anything, um, any new certification of the septic system on the property. So um, we, I don't know whether we want to try to reach out to the applicant about. I will reach out to the applicant and, and notify him that uh, we are conducting Zoom public hearings and see if he wants to continue on to that date or if he has to request a continuation to another date. Okay. So, by the way, can you see? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. So potentially, does the night does the nineteenth uh, work for you, Ken? Uh, yeah, that's Tuesday nights. The first and third Tuesdays usually. It's okay. a new it's a new year, so it's planning boards all the time. Mm. My evenings. And we'll get back to you in plenty of time if that proves to be unavailable. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm hoping to get some responses from the state regarding these questions. Um, the question about development in the floodway and how to address that. And um, without identifying the town, because I also don't want to, you know, have the state be like, uh, what happened? How did this, how does this happen? <laughs> um, so but I'll get the answer. They're probably gonna say we um, discourage, you know, favorite words. Bill, did you mention the Ken, the, the, the two issues that the state wrote about concerning the taking of land along Route 9? And you, you for, I glanced at it quickly and well, yeah, they said it, it's, it's Mike, the issues. Mike, that, Mike. The, Wait a minute. Ken may want to hang your on to listen to us talk about that one. Yeah. Okay. okay. I'll be happy to. Okay. Okay. So are we ready to move on to that? Yes. Okay. So this is what Lisa wants to listen to, too. 
This comes under the heading of not anticipated 48 hours in advance. I received an email uh, today from the building inspector who had received an email yesterday from a uh, appraiser uh, from Department of Transportation. And as part of the evaluating what's going to happen, uh, she posed a couple of questions. And I said I would bring it up tonight. So the first question, assume a parcel is legally conforming based on size, frontage, and setback. Assume also that a, a taking, a fee taking, will reduce lot size, frontage, and or setbacks to make it non-conforming. Would the property owner be penalized by this taking, or would this be treated by building, zoning, and planning authorities as a legally non-conforming use? I'm not sure what he means by penalized. Um, well, it would certainly become, in my opinion, it would certainly become a non-conforming lot, and depending what that does to the non-conforming lot, they may never be able to expand their business if they hadn't then rather than if they had the, the land not taken from them. I read it as them in a backdoor way of asking the question, if we take the land and they're not saying this, are they going to be harmed economically? And that's what they're really asking, even though they don't say it because if, 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 the, if, if it was conforming and the non-conforming and we said, well, that's fine, then they're not being harmed economically. I don't see what I'm saying. Yeah, I was assuming. That's what, that's what they're really asking. They're trying to figure out what the value, they're, 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 they're trying to figure out what the economic value of this taking is. And is it really 10 feet of land along the road or is it, which would they would prefer, or am I harming this business from an economic standpoint? And that's what you're, I think that's what they're not really telling you, but that's my read. If, if right. that's the case, then that will depend on a lot by lot taking. Exactly. Some lots that have more property, yeah, they're going to get paid for, but it may not harm them financially because they'll still have adequate parking. Case in point, the, uh, the uh, exotic auto at a corner of East Street and Route 9. They take 12 feet of his frontage. He's got, he, he can't even get into his, his garage anymore. No, oh, taking the whole parcel. You know, no. um, you go further up the road and somebody like, uh, I'll, I'll use Lisa, she's on this. They're going to take her handicapped parking away and much of her parking in the front yard. She's going to end up with less parking area capable down the long run. But in the meantime, she's going to be really pressed for parking, even in her front yard. You know, Randy's given us a drawing of where she could, or where the parking could be down the road and maybe it'll be okay. It's hard to say exactly, but they've got an easement where he, and the next question this guy has raised, this person is raising, that there is an easement that, that anybody can use. Well, the land still belongs to Lisa, but I'll be darned if she can access it. Because the, everybody in the state, anybody, any public person has the right to walk on this property, so she can't use it for anything that her property is on. Yeah. You know, so... And others, like, uh, well, across the street, um, Kulikowski's property, he's got a whole bunch of land. Taking 10 feet or 12 feet from him may not be as big a deal as taking 10 or 12 feet from a much smaller parcel of land. Exactly. So I don't think we want to even answer the question. So the, the zoning bylaw doesn't, doesn't address this, and it's going to be a case by case situation between the state and the landowner like and whatever, you know, we're, we can't get the, basically what the state is asking is, is to give them a waiver. 
there's no blanket answer to this. It really is going to depend no. on the parcel. I think you both are hitting something that I was going to speak about. It's a, it's a rather naive question for this uh, professional from the state to ask. And I think you're correct, Michael, in assuming they want to see if they can get away with something and not yes, uh, paying the, uh, the landowner. But the, but the one incident that I was aware of was on Stockbridge Street, uh, Pink Collis Corner there, when the town changed that a little bit. Then there was not sufficient frontage on that one building lot and not quite enough uh, square footage for a, a building lot. And that went to the Zoning Board of Appeals. And that seems like the logical answer from our point of view, if, if our eminent barrister Bill would agree that uh, it's a case by case situation and it probably has to go to the Zoning Board of Appeals. So we can't give a blanket statement. statement. Well, sure. I think it absolutely is case by case because, <clears throat> again, to use Lisa's example, um, there'll be a detrimental impact by having the, uh, the whatever the taking uh, has. There's also a detrimental impact in that you may never be able to expand. Um, so um, yeah, I can't can't say for sure on it. There's there's no one answer. It is lot by lot. Well, it's the same answers to the next one. That they, it's also, I mean, Bill can read this, but also this is the, the second question. It's also assumed that an easement is taken along the road frontage. In some cases, this easement can have a significant. In some cases, this easement can have a significant impact. An example might be a highway easement, which allows for sidewalk shared use paths or other roadway improvements to be located on private property in the easement area. Essentially, the public has the right at all times to travel and use the easement area. Can an area with a highway or other pub permanent public easement still be used to calculate the maximum lot coverage ratio? I don't know. Um, I would be inclined to say no. That's what I would. Uh, that's, that's my feeling too. Yeah. If you, if you can't use that lot, if you can't use it. Why count it? How yeah. can you count it? That's like saying wetlands counts as uh, it, it, it wetlands counts as the overall land, but it doesn't count towards open space or can't can't be used for anything else. It's just part of a lot that you don't count for anything. So, yeah. so reiterate, we don't want to say anything from my point of view, at least, that gives the state ammunition against the landowner. Yeah, you're thinking, Ken. I can see you sitting there. That one is an interesting one. Um, the first one, I agree that it's case by case. However, you, you know, you all want to communicate that to the state. But the second one, so the suggestion is that would there that the easement be counted towards lot coverage or your dimensional regulations? Right. I'm trying to think of instances where you count easements for sometimes you approvals can happen like if you have an easement for access, right? Yeah, so yeah. does that consider does that fall in within the same vein of counting towards dimensional regulations and or yeah which would include lot coverage i'm not i can't pinpoint a certain situation where that was the case it seems like that would be to the benefit of the landowner if i'm hearing the question right or if i'm you know that they're saying, even though we've made this easement unusable to the landowner, will you still let them count it towards their required, you know, which would allow them to do certain things, even though it's not functionally open space? But that, well, yeah, that's but, why I hear it. That's a good question, question because our, our question. Questions one and two mutually exclusive, or can they use an answer to one to go back to the other one? 
Well, they're they're they are a bit different, but the thing is, on the second one, it can both count and help the landowner, and it can also count against them. In other words, if they have a small lot, and this is the paved sidewalk area, that's now considered um, non green Yeah, it's and if they're close on park coverage on a smaller lot. This can hurt them because they can't use it. If it is, if they're okay on the area, then it may not hurt them. But if there's somebody that has a smaller lot and they have um, paved area, and you can't have more than certain percentage of paved and building, etc., this additional sidewalk area, which is actually considerable, it's like what a six or eight foot wide sidewalk. Um, that yeah, could that's... that could count against them in the coverage area, so it's a two, just a double edged sword. Typically, when somebody has a farm easement for somebody to go across their property, we haven't really paid any attention to that because it's basically just open space. But in this case, it's a bit different because it's not going to be open space. It's actually going to be pretty much a paved area, a sidewalk. So that's a good point. You know, it could yeah. hurt them. It's, I'm, I'm guessing it would hurt them more than it's going to help them or could hurt them more than help. But because it was, it was probably in most cases, it was previously their undeveloped setback, which has now been eaten up by the widening of the highway. It, it'll still count the setback area, no question about it. In other words, if the, if the tank, if the tank, you know, six, um, if it's if it's a six foot easement, rather, they're still going to have their six feet of frontage. We'll still count that. But as far as counting it as the open space or something a lot, it's it's it's. I'm not sure this is going to be open space in many cases. It's actually going to be a sidewalk, from what I understand. Yeah, so that's what I was I was wondering if she's asking what was her name, Jenny, if she's asking, will you give a give a wild card to the landowners that what was their undeveloped space can still count towards their undeveloped space, even though we'll we're probably gonna pave the heck out of it with our sidewalks and our shared pathways. That's how I was I thought maybe she was asking that question, like, will we turn a blind eye to the state's impervious because it wasn't added by the landlord? Will we still give them the credit of that as undeveloped space because it wasn't developed by them? And if we give them credit for that, then the state has no damages. Right. I would not give them credit for it. They're paving. No. It's covered land. It's it's it's, it's impervious. Yeah, I, I I think Concom would not like that because they're trying to find ways to absorb, you know, rainfall. Impervious to me is impervious, regardless of who did it. Yeah, whatever the case may want to call it. So, um, yeah. Okay. You going to respond to this bill, or do you want me to respond? Uh, I can respond to Tom, or if, if you want to. Actually, I, I'm fine. If you want to respond, just copy me. Okay. Um, actually, I guess you can copy everyone just without. I copy everybody. Uh, Ken, I just sent you uh, forwarded you the email that we're talking about. Okay. I love these zoning questions. These are like really you know, in depth and you have to think about how you answer them <laughs> because especially if it's in writing, the state's gonna be like, see, the planning board said that we could do that and we're not going to cause a detriment to the property owner. Um, so yeah, it's um, an acknowledgement that you definitely have all your ducks in a row when you're thinking about, when you're thinking about these things. Yeah. Look what? Let's what? try and stay out of the Commonwealth versus Hadley Planning Board. <laughs> right. <laughs> my, my guess. Bring it on. 
I'm, my guess is they're asking these questions is because they're being hit with the same question when they go to some. Yeah. Jim, maybe you, uh, maybe you and I can collaborate on the answer. That okay. will not be that constitutive. Yeah. Oh, be before I send it out, I want to make sure you read it to make sure that what we are saying is what we agree on. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think that takes care of their questions. They only had those two. Yep, that's for now. Yeah. <laughs> um, I do have an invoice for the Gazette for the legal notice for the uh, uh, whose public hearing is coming up? Oh, the uh, close of public hearing on January fifth for three hundred twenty-four dollars and eighty-six cents to the Gazette. These legal ads are getting quite expensive for little short paragraphs. I'll make a motion to uh, pay the Gazette 329.86. Well, 324.86. On 324.86. 324.86 on COSO. Yes. I'll second it. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Um... I have nothing else. So there's a Dree on a Colombian horse. Can you see it? Put <laughs> over to your right a little bit. I like it. <laughs> and up a little bit. Uh, Pull it back a little bit. It's too close to the screen. No, that's it. That's good. Uh, the, there's the horse. That's cute. Wow. <laughs> she. They went out to the plains of Colombia. You know, Bogota is in the mountains. It's the Andes, but you, you drive seven hours and it's flat and there's a lot of cattle out there. It's very simple lifestyle. Farmers ride around in the horses. You know, that's how they tender their cattle. Just no uh, four wheelers. <laughs> and the horse knows their way home at night. So. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's why Zeke doesn't come over here anymore on Tuesday. Audrey's not here to cook. <laughs> when is she coming back? Not till the fifth. Um, it's me and Ta me and Tail, me and my dog. Okay. Anybody have anything else? Uh, Bill, did you want to talk about the AHT? Um, we did receive uh, the town did receive an opinion of council, which did not address the question <laughs> that uh, we had about whether the um, Affordable Housing Trust Fund had the legal authority to enter into a rental supplement agreement. Uh, I thought I sent a clear inquiry. Um, it was paraphrased. And, and it turned into an inquiry about whether it had to go back to town meeting for approval, which is the question they answered. And they said, no, it doesn't have to go back to town meeting. Well, I think we all knew that. The trust is pretty clear. So uh, uh, David Phil forwarded that to me this afternoon. Uh, I replied with my comments. Um, and uh, we will, I guess, see what direction, whether, whether he's able to turn around the new opinion of council uh, in time for tomorrow's meeting or not. Hmm. Okay. Well, anyway, all righty. Anybody else have anything? If not, everybody have a good holiday season. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Happy Hanukkah. Sure. Whatever the, as the case may be. Anti-COVID. Motion to adjourn. So moved. I would second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Meeting is history. Thank you, and thank you, John. Have a good one, Ken. Thank you. Take care, Ken.